Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you're here for the Europe briefing. Sorry, I'm just going to turn off all oh, the lights already off. Good. So, um, it'll only take about a, about 30 minutes, and then we'll have lots of time for questions. I mean, ostensibly, we have two hours, but in briefing, we never go for that long. Okay? So, um, the slides are actually on the web. You can go to this link, bit.ly, um, soc dash Europe dash eighteen ten. that's this semester, and then you can pick this up. Uh, it's going on to the video right now. Later on, I'll put it up on YouTube in case you want to have friends who couldn't make it, and then they can watch the briefing in double time if they like. Okay, so um, the one that, uh, there are lots of these slides on the web, because every time I do this, I, I'll record it and put the slides up. Um, they're a little bit different because the requirements change over time. So just make sure you're looking at the right deck. So this is the one for today, uh, for people starting uh, Europe next semester. Okay, I mean at the end of this semester, actually. Yeah. Okay. Can you guys all see all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is semester one. Uh, it's not SR two. I gotta go fix that. Okay. And so uh, you probably all know what Europe is for, right? Uh, so in many universities that are research intensive, they have undergraduate students start to do research. And uh, when I was an undergraduate, that was many, many years ago, I also benefited from uh, something like Europe. It wasn't as formalized as that, uh, but it was a chance for undergraduates to work with professors and then they start to learn the ideas of research. So typically, Europe involves uh, a couple of different uh, steps. It's basically to teach you the scientific method in practice. You may have already done it in JC, you may have already done it in poly, or if you are an IB student, you might have also done it in your school. Okay, But typically, it goes through this process of going through the entire scientific method, where first, you have a problem that you're trying to figure out. Okay, Maybe it's not very well formed, and you need to understand what it is, and actually, uh, for me, especially in my research area, that can take almost uh, one-third to one-half of the time to actually come up with the problem, okay? So it's very much different than, let's say, homework assignments or projects that you get in classes because usually these problems are not well-formed. You know, the lecturer or the professor or the postdoc or the PhD student who you'll be working closely with will have some idea of what the problem is but hasn't cemented it in stone, okay? So you have to decide with your professor often, what exactly is the problem, okay? Then after that, you have to go study what other people have done, right? Because uh, we are all standing on the shoulder of giants in the sense that all of the scientific literature out there has enabled the level of competing that we have today. So you have to do a literature survey. It doesn't mean just looking at Google Scholar and just saying a bunch of keywords and then, oh, look, that's all. Um, uh, and oftentimes, uh, you have to uh, go look outside of the literature that you can easily access and look at things that are harder to access, such as journals and other things of that sort. Thankfully, most of our competing literature is online and open source, so it's easier to get. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of research seminars happening in Singapore. SOC is no exception. We have seminars almost every day. So um, you can check out what's going on and with your professor, um, decide which seminars are worthwhile attending. And then after that, you should be proposing and implementing solutions to uh, your uh, problem that you formulated, right? And then um, uh, documenting it and presenting the results, okay? So that will be one cycle of research. Now, many times I tell students, you know, actually, um, you want to do this multiple times, right? You don't want to just do it one time because uh, it's actually really important to go through the cycle several times. You know, you can think of them as small sprints for research. So you do problem formulation, you do a literature review, you uh, implement a solution, you take a look at how well that solution works or not, okay? You find the shortcomings and then you propose yet another way of form formulating the problem to address the shortcomings of your previous solution, okay? So you do that several times and hopefully if you've gone through this a couple of times, you'll have enough to publish a scientific conference or workshop paper. Okay, so Europe in uh, the School of Computing actually consists of two modules. Uh, both are worth four MCs, so they're done not uh, in joint but in, in series. Okay, so you take uh, 3208 
in the first SAM, 3209 in the second <coughs> SAM. And there are some prerequisites, that's just for your safety, okay? Because we find that there are some students, even in year one, even like year 0.5, that are really, really interested in doing research as soon as they come in, and it's usually not a good idea. Why is that? Because even though you're very enthusiastic, you could uh, actually spend too much time on your project or zero time on your project, and you'll hurt your CAP, right? So we want to make sure that you are going into the project having a good record of doing your course as well, and you have bandwidth to spare, okay? So that's why we ask you to complete at least 60 MCs worth of work, have a minimum CAP of about 3.8, okay? And then you get approval from the CS or IS department to take a year off. That's basically me rubber stamping what your advisor says and saying, okay, yeah, you're good to go, okay? And now we have two different versions of your op. There's the two semester version, which you do both of these in series, and then a one semester version, which is just the first one. Uh, you can do that during the summer. Obviously, it's too late for that now, uh, but you can think of it if you want to postpone it, if you're going for SCP, etc. And uh, oftentimes, people in their third year, is anyone here third year student? Yeah, okay. So if you're in your third year and you're thinking about doing FYP in your fourth year, what you can do is do one semester of your op, okay, and then do your final year project. Then you have one and a half years to accomplish everything, right? So FYP, you probably know, is 12 MCs, then you add another four to 16 MCs worth of work on a project. Uh, but often people do a year op and then, you know, because they like the research area or they decide research is fun, but I don't want to stay in this area, they do year op and FYP either in the same lab or in two separate labs and you get a lot of exposure for research. So that's great because then you would have finished 20 MCs, quite a lot of research for an undergraduate. Okay, so 90% of the projects, like I stated here, uh, are for two semesters. Okay, and there's an obvious reason for that. Can you guys tell me? I know this is not meant to be too interactive, but you know, it's a small group, come on. Why do you think we, we mostly propose two semester projects? Research takes a long time. Research takes a very long time, right? So typically what happens when you start as a, a first semester student, um, you know, if you go back here, you know, this problem formulation, like your professor hands you a problem, I don't know what the heck that is, okay, so you study it for a while, and then uh, you start to do your literature survey, and heck, uh, you know, it's like uh, week seven now, Suddenly you're very busy with your other projects, your midterms, uh, other things of that sort, and then, oh, you know, it's already the end of the semester. I haven't done anything except my literature review, okay? So that would be really bad if you're doing a one semester year off and you haven't really contained uh, the project scope, okay? This is why most professors say, you know, you want to invest your time, that's fine, do it for two semesters at least, because our graduate students, our full-time research PhD students, are doing nothing but research, and usually they still have a hard time with working with this, okay? But uh, in any case, if you can think about this, if we look at the 90% of the projects that are proposed, it looks a little bit like this. You have these two, two project modules down here, okay, you're up one and you're up two, and how is it evaluated? 50% is due to your supervisor, who you work with one-on-one, -on -one. okay, 50% is due to two other evaluators, okay? So how does it work? Okay, the 50% coming from your supervisor, actually only 10% of it comes in the first semester. Okay? Because like I said, well, what can you do in one semester? Basically, get a little bit of understanding about the research, right? So you formulate the problem, you read about it, you maybe implement the baseline, or you study the theory behind it, etc., and you have a good understanding of the problem. Okay? Then, in the second semester, you actually do all the work, right? you uh, implement a solution, or you uh, have a better proof, a tighter bound, etc., and you write it up. You have to actually convince people that what you're doing is good work, right? So that comes uh, at the second half of the project, right, in CP 3209. So you, as, uh, around week eight, around now, uh, students who are doing their second semester of Europe need to do an oral presentation to their uh, project group, and then at the end of the semester, they have to write their final report, which they'll give to their supervisor. They're going to be graded 30% of their whole entire grade for that. And then their uh, independent examiners will only see them one time, okay? At the end of both semesters, you have a project presentation. And you have to impress them well enough to get a good grade on the project, okay? Any questions so far? Pretty straightforward? Okay, 50% due to your supervisor. 
25% due to each of the independent supervisors, uh, in, uh, independent examiners. Okay, like it says here, you'll get an IP grade after the first semester if you're doing a two semester work, you're up. And then your, your CAP will be back calculated to the previous semester when you get your grade for CP3209. Okay. So in the one semester version, anyone here is considering a one semester year off? Most of you are doing two? Okay. Uh, for the sake of posterity, I'll tell you about this anyways. Okay. So this is the same structure. It's just compacted into one semester. Again, 50% due to both components, your supervisor 50%. And 50% due to your two evaluators. Okay, actually, this happens a lot when people do a two-semester year out, but for some reason, after the first sem, they struggle and they want to drop. So then we have to defend the one-semester year out, and some people fall into this category. Okay, so if that happens to you, or you choose to do a one-semester year out, bridging into an FYP, or just a one-semester year out, just like uh, here, you know, ending then you'll have to do this, okay? So you have to do uh, your literature review, which would happen right about now if you started in April last year, April this year, and then 40% would be due to your final presentation and overall performance at the end of the semester. Pretty straightforward, right? No problems, right? Both, both of the year op options are, are pretty identical, okay? So this is the schedule for uh, this semester. Today is October 3rd. So uh, applications are open. Uh, we have some uh, applications here, so I'll pass those out later. Okay, and we can get some more. The UG office is just over there. Put your application forms into the undergraduate office. This is actually not Ms. Quick, uh, so let me uh, fix that up in a little while. Um, you will be informed when it's approved. Uh, you can get the project assignment form signed by your supervisor and hand it to uh, Ms. Uh, Jaying. Uh, so she's the administrator for Europe, okay? And I'll just show you what these forms look like, okay? So here's the form. Uh, it just has some details about uh, your ID, okay? You have to check which uh, version of Europe you're going to do. You have to declare whether you're a USP student or not. Any USP students here? Okay, so we have a couple USP. So you guys are, are doing it for ISM credit as well. So you get two ISM credits for doing that independent study module, so um, that's nice. And then you can tell us, you know, what uh, areas of computing are you interested in, um, information about any past research that you've done or congresses that you've done and any awards and prizes. That's certainly not necessary. It's just for our information, okay? And then we'll just check that you have the 60 MCs. We'll just check that your CAP meets the deadline, uh, uh, sorry, the threshold. Then uh, I'll just rubber stamp it and then you're good to With go. 60 means including the modules that are coming to you. Yes, yes, okay. yes. So it doesn't mean that you completed it as of right now. It means you have completed it at the end of the semester, which is when you're starting your up. Okay, actually, you start your up as soon as your supervisor says it's okay to start. So you can actually start pretty much right away. So okay. if you're 15 now, that's okay. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's correct. Okay. I also show you the project assignment form. So you usually do both of these in tandem. Okay. The project uh, application form is uh, just to get entry into Europe, but it doesn't help to get a Europe without a supervisor, so you have to do both in tandem. So what you'll need to do is find a supervisor in the school. That takes a little bit of groundwork on your part. You know, you have to go to uh, different lab pages, uh, go contact a professor. If you work with a professor or you've taken a course with a professor and you sort of like what they're teaching or that's their area that they work on, then you can ask them. Right. Do you have a euro? You know, uh, ma'am or sir, uh, things like that. Okay. So uh, you can put in your supervisor's name, a project title, a project number, and uh, your information there, and tell us what type of uh, version you're doing, either your two semester or one semester. Okay. And uh, this just has the signature of the supervisor to say that they've uh, agreed that they'd like you to uh, work with them. Okay. All right, so you might be wondering, okay, great, all that's fine, but how do I find uh, a professor? Okay. So um, actually, you can do this anytime. Uh, ostensibly, we close semester registrations for Europe on November 5th, so try to do it this month. Even if you don't meet this deadline, please send in the form. Okay, we actually accept it on a rolling basis, so if you're late, you can do this, but it's a good idea to have a time frame 
Otherwise, you know, you'll be very, very late and you'll have to postpone it to next semester. Okay? So, how do you find projects? You have to be proactive. Now, I know this is midterms week. I mean, we have a midterm tomorrow in my class, so it's a, it's a bit rushed, okay? But you have to do your groundwork. I mean, I'm, people are not going to be asking you, can you join my project team, right? You have to approach the faculty. How do you do it? You go through uh, the project admin site, okay? So here we are. This, uh, this is my version of it, which uh, I can see from the lecture point of view. Okay, but let's see. Uh, nope, I wanted to go up here. Okay, so uh, you're here at the 2019-2020 semester one. That's when you're defending. Okay, so uh, if you click this, you can see all of the different projects that are here. Now, there's only 35 projects here. Okay, and I've put them on the slide. But what I'd like you to do is also go here. Okay. This is the FYP site. So if you saw me click, this is the final year projects, 2019-2020, okay? And there will be a lot more projects here. There are 84, okay? And um, actually, this is the semester that's less students taking FYP in Europe. So you should also click to the SEM2 project listing, which should have even more, okay? So there are like 248 projects, okay? A lot of projects okay now these are for FYP but professors tend to do the same thing for FYP in Europe okay I mean our research areas don't change a whole lot okay so even if we didn't propose a Europe in the particular area that you care about okay you can approach the professors and say look I saw this FYP or I saw that your students are working on this project I would like to do something in that area all right maybe could I do it as a, uh, a Europe student instead? Could you propose this Europe for me? Or maybe I can counter propose because I, I'm a student, I have an interest in a particular application area, a particular theoretical area. I want to learn about this. Uh, you seem to be the right professor for me. Um, could you entertain a meeting with me so that I can get to know you better? Okay. So uh, do both of those things. Talk with any faculty whose areas is of interest to you. Browse both the Europe and the FIP projects. Okay? This will take you an hour's time, but it will be totally worth it. Okay? Why do I say this? Because, you know, if you're going to do Europe, you're doing eight MCs worth of work. It's not a small amount of work. Okay? You could choose to do it with any of our 100 plus faculty members. Okay? Every professor has a different temperament. They all structure their labs differently. My lab is very different from another lab who also does the same type of research. Okay? And for that reason, you really should try to get a good match. Right? If you email like three professors and one of them gets back to you and you meet them and you're like, oh, well, I guess that's okay, and you choose that lab, guess what? It may not be the optimal fit. Okay? So what should you do? You should try pretty hard this month to get an audience with at least three or four live members of the faculty, okay? Not just settle for email communications if possible, right? Because when you interact with people or they tell you, you know, you can talk with my graduate student or something like that, it gives you a much better sense of whether that's a good lab to work for, okay? Now, it could be that, you know, you don't care about your supervisor so much, you're pretty independent, you can do it on your own, that's fine. But most of us, especially at your age where you're just starting research, it would actually be helpful if you could talk to somebody on a regular basis, okay? So for that reason, you know, you should actually think of it like, uh, I don't know, a college admissions test or something like that, where you uh, try to, you know, uh, broadcast at least to five to ten lecturers, uh, faculty members, and check with them whether they're willing to meet with you, okay? Those who can meet with you, you check their projects out, you see whether you like the style that they supervise, you talk with their students, and then you make a decision, okay? Because otherwise, it's, it's a little bit difficult, right? Like you choose modules, you do the same thing. You, you ask your friends, hey, is this lecture any good? Maybe that, that, that one's not, not such a great lecturer, okay? So you can also propose your own project. So this is the project assignment form that you can propose, okay? Now, I'll be honest with you. Many profs will entertain this type of application but some of our more senior profs may not, okay? They have gotten to be very famous in their particular area of research, okay? That means 
they had to narrow down the scope of their research to be good at it, right? Because if you do everything, you're good at nothing, right? Okay, so in some ways, even if you want to propose your own project, you may want to find a professor who has more bandwidth, who's more junior, that's able to accommodate your interests. Okay, so there's a, a difference in the type of field that you might want to do uh, when you're proposing your own project. Okay, you can also use this when you talk to a professor and say, you know, I don't quite match the project expertise that you want for this area, or I'm not quite aligned to this interest. Can we jointly propose another project? Okay, and then the professor will be, okay, great. Why don't we download this form, work on it together in the appointment, and then we'll write it up. Okay, because professors, of course, are pretty busy. They hate writing up project proposals just as much as you hate doing project write-ups, right? Okay, so if you can save them the time by writing the project proposal for them, then that's great, you know, that you save some, 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 some time. Okay, so you can uh, uh, fill in a project title, uh, description of the proposed project, and you sign for it, uh, and then, um, you know, somebody will enter it into the system on our side, that's Jaying, and then we'll assign you to your own project under the professor who's agreed to supervise you. Okay, so that's another way to do it. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay, so um, here are all the different types of projects that are going on. I just, I know it's really, really bad. Okay, I got to re-screenshot that. Um, so there are uh, projects that are more implementation, um, that have some research components, like uh, Anand Bojan is doing a cross-platform application for children of autistic spectrum disorder. We have people like in the database group, like uh, Chi Yong, who are doing query reverse engineering and uh, supporting cardinality uh, constraints in database system. There's a couple projects by our media group, uh, food nutrition, disease knowledge graph construction, food recommendation, nudging engine for healthy lifestyles, uh, things of this sort for healthy living. Um, that's uh, our media group. And uh, other ones of other sorts, like um, these are all, I think, uh, yeah, Trevor's projects on uh, computer architecture, so optimizing pipelines for energy efficient AI, accelerating um, SAT solvers in hardware and software, and other ones from the database group like uh, machine learning for devices with privacy constraints. Okay, so again, you can look all over the place and, and start with the Europe ones. When you finish looking through the Europe ones, go through the FYP ones. When you finish those, then you should have shortlisted maybe five to ten lecturers who you can go to their homepage, their labs, and then check out. Okay, that, that would be the process that I would do. Okay, so uh, we tell our faculty what the difference is between Europe and FYP because they need to know. Okay, because sometimes they're new to our faculty too and they, they haven't done it before. So as you can see here, what do we do about this? We say that Europe students are usually younger than FYP. They're obviously not year four. Any year four students here? Okay, we, we actually get some people who take year four, year off than FYP, but hopefully not any of you. Okay, so year off students, you guys are year two, year three. Um, you tend to have a higher CAP requirement for that. And uh, FYP is not necessarily research oriented. It can be implementation oriented, like you could do a software engineering project. That doesn't work for Europe. Okay, Europe says research. That's what the R is there for. So you have to go through the scientific method. Okay. So it's really for students like you, hopefully many of you are considering postgraduate degrees or you're just curious about what it's like to do computer science or information systems research, then uh, we'd like to have you in this program. Okay? It's only required for students in Turing. Any of you are in the Turing program? Okay. Uh, so I think most of them are coming next year. And uh, very, very importantly, uh, Europe students are supposed to work the full year. Okay. That means you know, summer rolls around, you want to go off to internship and other things, you still have to do your own. Okay, that's not like FYP. FYP, uh, you take summer off, okay, because you might be doing internship otherwise. Okay, your off students can also do internships, but it's expected they continue to do their research. Okay, that seems a little unfair because after all, FYP is worth 12 MCs, your off is only worth 8. How come I have to work the whole year? Okay, because we really want you to get a good research output. Okay, we want you to have a good experience 
during the entire life cycle of scientific research. And you know, quite a number of our students go on to publish papers, even win university level awards. Okay, so that's very important. Okay? And we also try to incentivize our supervisors, our faculty. You know, Europe students are the creme de la creme. They are very interested in research. Many of them, if they work with you and they're really excited to work with you, they'll come back for FYP. Okay? And uh, I have a couple students in that case. Like I had a Europe student who um, did his FYP with me as well. Then he went to Stanford to do his PhD. Then he graduated and is now in Google Brain making, I don't know, way more than I am. Right? Um, he's one of the people uh, doing the machine translation work in Google. So, um, yeah, so there are lots of good outcomes for that. I have a, other, a couple other students who are, uh, again, from our undergraduate research cohort doing FIP in Europe, and they also did their PhD with me. So uh, they spent, <laughs> I don't know, like almost 10 years in SOC. That's scary, right? Okay, so in any case, I tell them the difference, right? So this is a independent Research project, usually one-on-one -on -one with your supervisor. FYP is, could be software engineering, could be a team project. They don't work summers. Okay? It is required of CEGs to do FYPs, and it's only required of uh, CS Turing students to do uh, Europe. Okay, this is here uh, if you need it. Uh, so you get some small amount of support from the school. You just have to apply to it, uh, and then we'll give you these resources. You have extra quota for black and white paper, color paper, and uh, if you need to present a poster or something like that, we'll cover you for that. Okay? You get $50 of budget for small items claims. Um, pretty much whatever your supervisor says is good. Sometimes, for example, you do human studies. Like you want people to take a survey. And you're going to remunerate them a little bit because they've taken this five-minute survey for you, so you can do that. Okay. There are some small amount of exceptions that almost don't apply to a lot of people anymore. Um, so for CS students, um, if you're in Turing, this clause applies to you. It doesn't apply to general CS students. If you're in comp bio, which I think none of you are, so I think there's only one comp bio student left in the school, this applies to you. For, but for USP students, uh, as you already know probably, it counts for two ISM modules. Okay, so uh, if you want to apply for any of these, after you do your op, then you apply for the exemption. Okay, so you do it after you finish everything, I've done it, then give me my two ISMs. Okay, granted. <coughs> okay, so uh, this is one of our uh, pretty current uh, Europe students. He graduated last year and um, is doing, uh, I think, graduate school now. So you work with Brian Lowe, who's our, one of our AI profs doing Gaussian processes. And uh, he did great. He published like three rank one papers, which is hard to beat for a, 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 even a PhD student. Okay? So he got to travel around the world to, uh, to present his work. He's gotten citations, and um, he's working in graduate school now. So he says, you know, it was pretty hard, the project that uh, Brian gave him, but after uh, more than a year and then uh, subsequent years afterwards, he honed his skills and continued to publish work in this area. He also won the Outstanding uh, Researcher Award uh, for his work, which carries a prize of another $500. Okay. So here's another one from another AI researcher. This is from uh, the NLP group. So he worked on statistical machine translation, just like the student that I talked to you about earlier. And he said something a little bit simpler. If you're liking challenges and you really want to try to work one-on-one -on -one with a professor, really, this is a very good way to go. Okay? How many of you might be interested in graduate school or a PhD? Okay. I will have to say that the School of Computing is one of the very unique places in, I don't know, the next... 5,000 kilometers or so from here that allows you to do research at the undergraduate level. Okay, it's really, really a unique opportunity for you to do this. Okay, and if you do this type of research and you can get a good letter of recommendation from your supervisor, it opens doors up very wide for you to go postgraduate anywhere. Okay, so like I said, we, we put students every university that you can think of that's high ranked MIT, Stanford, Georgia Tech, uh, I, I don't know, too many to think about. Okay, so uh, definitely if you do a good job during Europe, 
your supervisor will of course try to push you to publish your work. Okay, we have plenty of students that do that. Within my group, maybe about half of the Europe students manage to publish. Sometimes they don't manage to publish within the Europe year. They may be publishing during their FYP year because it takes a, a bit of time to get everything out in the cycle, but it's very useful. Okay, There are plenty of graduate schools that are looking specifically for students with undergraduate research background. And that's a very hard differentiating factor, especially in Asia. There are very, very few universities that can do that. Okay, So I think you're very blessed if you are thinking of doing research and you want to tie yourself up with a professor for one year in Europe and then maybe an additional year in FIP, you can really make very good use of this time if you'd like to. Okay, There are some issues. Uh, you can read these in, in the slides if you want. There's a, a slot for Europe lectures. What the heck is a Europe lecture? It's, it's nothing. Okay, We need a placeholder for it in the timetable. That's all. Okay, Is Europe graded on the final report that we submit? Because after you do your presentation, you have to put a final report down. Do we grade you on that? Answer is no. We grade you on the report that you submit for presentation. Okay, so after the presentation, your examiners may say, hey, you should change this, this, you have to add some citations here, this experiment isn't done properly. You're supposed to fix those, and you need to do that before you deposit your final thesis, okay, but you're going to be graded on the presentation. Unfortunately, your professors and your examiners don't have enough time to check so many documents. Okay, um, you don't have to do hard copy. Uh, exchange students are allowed to take place in Europe, so if you see exchange students here and they're like, uh, I'm going to be here for another semester, can I take Europe? You can tell them. Uh, and uh, like I said here, some of the students who drop Europe after the first SEM actually have to defend it in second SEM as a one semester version. Okay? So that's it. Um, we don't have anything else to tell you about that. Uh, I have some application forms here. So if you want to take some, um, there are a couple, and I, I will run to the office and get some more. So just pass these out. There are two forms there, uh, project assignment form and the project.